transition. Uh, you're really trying to get out of it. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so we only have one speaker this afternoon, so uh, I guess we can go for two hours. Uh, uh, the speaker is uh, Rob Brindenthal from University of Washington, and he's going to talk about the peculiar behavior of stationary and accelerating vortices. Uh, his computer just gave up. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come. It's always great to come to Bangalore, and, and this meeting and the organization of it have been terrific. Uh, I've learned a lot. I don't know anything about uh, tropical conven convection, and as you'll see, I'm still in kindergarten. So I'm going to take you from uh, the very sublime talks we've had, very sophisticated uh, things, to very simple uh, questions related to turbulent entrainment. And uh, I'm going to blame other people. Uh, and I'm reminded that uh, there are two uh, Indians who have contributed to this uh, along, the, along the way. Uh, speaking of kindergarten, we're going to have a little quiz now. Uh, um, I have a question for you. Imagine you have an experiment where you have fresh water, floating on top of salt water in a fish tank. This is a little bit simpler than um, the monsoon. And there's a jet coming up from, from below of salt water. So a salt water jet into salt water with fresh water floating on top and the thin interface separating the two. Do you have the picture? So experiment A has the jet vertical. Experiment B is exactly the same as A, except the jet is tilted just 15 degrees, 1-5 degrees, and precessed. There's a rotating nozzle block here, so the jet does this. Do you understand uh, the experiment? Mm -hmm. So here's the question. Which of these two experiments has the greater entrainment rate across this thin stratified interface? Question? Yes. Please raise your four, one of your four limbs. <laughs> Sir? Clarification. How big is the time comparing to the jet? I'm thinking about if you would drive at some point of circulation between the lower fluid, it would also contribute to a train. The nozzle diameter is very small uh, compared with this. Physically, this tank was, I don't know, a, a foot or two, uh, roughly speaking. I don't know what that is in metric. Right. Correct. Yeah, that's a good question. I should have said that. And, and there's no fish in it. <laughs> no. So, uh, which of these two experiments do you think has the greater entrainment rate? As the, as the flow impinges on this, the turbulence at the interface will pull down upper fluid, so the interface will rise upward due to that entrainment. Also due to the <coughs> excuse me, the volume flow rate of the jet. But we subtract out the volume flow rate of the jet. So which of these two experiments do you think has a greater entrainment rate? Please. Everything's the same, same phase of the moon, same tank. The only thing difference is the tilt and precess of the... Oh, thank you for sharing that. But we'll ask everyone. Uh, how many people think uh, experiment A has a greater entrainment rate? Please raise a forelimb. How many... I'll tell you later. How many people think B has a greater entrainment rate? Uh, how many, I forgot to give you this option. How many, how many people thought it's fine? <laughs> how many think the entrainment rates are the same? Do you think they're the same? I didn't give you that option, but okay. So stay tuned. I'll tell you the answer in a little bit. Well, uh, Aline Cotel from France uh, did this experiment. And uh, with a sheet of laser light and the thin interface here, and we used uh, a pH indicator, uh, disodium fluorescein, so that uh, this bright stuff is turned on <laughs> and produced when there's mixing. And when the jet is vertical, you get this impingement dome. And interestingly, there's almost no mixing at ground zero. Most of the mixing is on the sides. <laughs> at a later time and higher Reynolds number, 
Royal's number of about 12,000. Um, and she measured the dimensionless entrainment rate as a function of the Richardson number, which is uh, the dimensionless number that uh, measures the strength of the stratification, the racial potential of kinetic energy. And she found that the uh, entrainment rate uh, had a slope on a log-log plot of minus a half, and then it was a cliff, and then the entrainment rate was essentially flat. The reason why there's a cliff, we believe, is because at a certain Richardson number, even the smallest possible eddies, the Kamogorov microscale eddies, are stratified. They don't have enough kinetic energy to pull down a tongue of fluid across the interface. So at higher Richardson numbers, the interface, the interface is flat for all eddies. And therefore, the Richardson number has to drop out of the problem. Flat is flat. And so the entrainment rate has to be independent of Richardson number in this flat regime. The slope of these lines is, as I said, minus a half. That's for the vertical jet. Here are the data uh, for the vertical jet impinging and also the precessing jet. The slope of this line for the precessing jet is minus three halves. Uh, this is, I should have said, <coughs> excuse me, a plot of entrainment, dimensionless entrainment rate as a function of Richardson number. And I want to call your attention to two things. First of all, um, <clears throat> at the highest Richardson number on this plot, the entrainment rate differs by over two orders of magnitude. So the effect is not small. Remember, everything's the same about these two experiments, except there's a little bit of wiggling going on. I call it the Elvis Presley effect. And the second surprising thing is that the vertical jet is the one with the higher entrainment rate. When you start precessing the jet, the entrainment rate doesn't go up, as intuition would suggest. It goes down by a lot. If we did this experiment at a higher Reynolds number, we believe that uh, you could conduct the experiment at, at high Richards number, and these curves would continue to diverge until you reach that cliff that I showed earlier. So there's something very weird going on here because you get a vastly different answer depending on some difference in the character of the impinging turbulence. And so we scratched our heads. Uh, what could explain that? Because even to a government employee, a factor of 100 is noticeable. And what we uh, came up with was a, uh, an argument that when a vortex is near an interface or a surface of any type, like the stratified interface that we just saw, there's an intrinsic velocity ratio, the ratio of the rotational to the translational speed. It's a measure of the stationarity of the vortex with respect to the surface. And I'm going to try to persuade you that that parameter is critical any time a vortex is near a surface. Uh, Professor Narasimha uh, alluded uh, in his talk earlier this week to the uh, famous entrainment hypothesis of Morton, Taylor, and Turner, uh, which said that the entrainment velocity <coughs> is always proportional to the characteristic velocity of the flow. And as he also pointed out, um, <coughs> this hypothesis breaks down sometimes. We tried to generalize that hypothesis uh, uh, to account for a variety of effects, such as compressibility and stratification, uh, rotation, and as we'll talk about today, uh, stationarity. The, the entrainment hypothesis of Morton, Taylor, and Turner can be uh, expressed as the entrainment velocity is proportional to the ratio of the size and rotation period of the biggest vortex. So it's natural to extend or generalize the entrainment hypothesis by imagining that in the general expression, the entrainment velocity would always be the ratio of a length to time scale appropriate for the eddy that's actually doing the entraining. In ordinary turbulence, it's always the biggest eddy that's doing the entraining. I shouldn't say the ordinary, but uh, for typical turbulence, uh, it's uh, usually the largest eddy that does the entraining. 
then I'll show some movies later about that. Um, but the biggest eddy isn't always the one that does the entraining. And that's what I want to try to generalize. <clears throat> so imagine that the entrainment velocity in the general case is the uh, entraining eddy size over the entraining eddy rotation period. That dimensionally is correct, and it might even be physically right. I'll only consider one case in the interest of time. I mentioned earlier uh, the high Richardson number limit. If you have a stratified interface, um, at high Reynolds number of turbulence, there's a spectrum of eddy sizes. There's papa bear, mama bear, and cute little baby bear, the smallest possible eddy. And if the Richardson number is high enough, uh, if, if the large eddy Richardson number is high enough, even the smallest eddy has an eddy Richardson number that's one or greater, in which case the interface is flat for all eddy sizes. This is the flat interface limit. Because it's flat, there can be no engulfment tongues. Roscoe's engulfment tongues can't pull fluid across the interface. So the only possible mechanism for transport of anything, mass momentum and energy, is the uh, diffusion of that quantity. So the entrainment velocity must be some uh, characteristic length scale. In this case, it's a diffusion length scale over um, the eddy time. And the diffusion length scale is a square root of the diffusivity times the, uh, the eddy time. But what is this eddy time? Because at high Reynolds number of turbulence, there's a spectrum of eddy sizes. Each one of these has a different rotation period. Well, there are two times that are special because there are two special eddies, the biggest and smallest. And so one would guess that there are two possible uh, solu uh, solutions. <coughs> and we believe <coughs> that Papa Bear, the largest eddy rotation period, is appropriate if the vortex is persistent or stationary and the smallest otherwise. <coughs> uh, so one can construct what uh, we call an entrainment diagram over the Reynolds number or Richardson number plane, where <laughs> for stratified entrainment, the entrainment rate um, depends upon, in general, Schmidt number, Reynolds number, Richardson number. <coughs> and this is what we believe is the correct um, entrainment diagram for the stationary limit, the persistent limit. And there you see a Richardson number to the minus a half <clears throat> this uh, corresponding to the uh, vertical jet. This double line represents a discontinuous transition. That's the cliff that you saw in Cotel's data. This is uh, flat country where... The connection. The connection. I was stepping on a roll wire. Probably wasn't smart. How's that? Is that better? So this is the flat domain where the entrainment rate is independent of Richard's number and only depends upon uh, diffusivities. Schmidt number is the ratio of diffusivities and Reynolds number. This is the corresponding entrainment diagram for the non-persistent or non-stationary limit where the vortices move with respect to the interface. And here you see uh, Richard's number of minus three halves, which we uh, observed uh, for the precessing case. I'm not going to go into those details <coughs> in the interest of time. Well, Feynman said that the uh, easiest person to fool is yourself. And so uh, we try to throw tomatoes at this idea, see if we can break it down. And if it's really true, if we're just not smoking something, that the stationarity of a vortex with respect to a, a surface is important when the interface is stratified, it also ought to be important when the interface is a solid wall. So this is not going to have much to do with uh, tropical convection, but I, w I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, the testing that we've done to see if this idea is correct when we, when we ask this question. <clears throat> well, the trouble with putting a, a, a vortex near a solid wall, if the wall is flat, is that the image vortex produces an unstable situation where it's unstable to long wavelength crow instability and short wavelength windmill instabilities. And 
If you can't hold the vortex stationary, you can't test the theory. You can't throw the tomato. And uh, Greg Ball had the idea that it's known that the von Karman, the temporal von Karman wake is quasi-stable. So if you replace the dividing streamline with a solid wall, then perhaps you can help stabilize the vortices. So the idea is that you take a <coughs> corrugated um, a wall and you put a vortex in the corresponding place on the upper half of this diagram. And here you see a couple of uh, wavy walls that we put in our water tunnel. Here, a wavy wall is painted black and there are vortex generators mounted upstream. So this was put in the tunnel, the water tunnel, and the flow first went over the vortex generators, which made the vortex, and we tried to position that right in the center of those troughs. And when you do that, even if the incident boundary layer is turbulent, we find that about half of the uh, wavelength of the wavy wall has been laminarized. Uh, this is a measure of the turbulent intermittency, and over one wavelength, about one half of the uh, cycle is laminarized. Just like the uh, impinging jet on the stratified interface, this is counterintuitive. Normally, when you add a strong vortex to a flow, the fluxes go down. <coughs> Here, sorry, the fluxes go up. Here, the fluxes go down. At flight Reynolds numbers, the uh, fluxes drop by about an order of magnitude, skin friction or heat transfer. However, however <coughs> Our, our mental uh, cartoon of the flow turned out to be completely wrong. That's interesting. Why did they tell me that now? Um, Olivia Dawson sketched what the streamlines really look like. And they don't look at all like the uh, von Karman wake. They look much more like Kilvin's cat's eyes. Now, this flow is interesting. Uh, back in, I think, the early 80s, uh, Oster and Wignansky looked at a shear layer, and I'll show you a movie of a shear layer later, where they <clears throat> vibrated a ribbon right at the trailing edge of the splitter plate of a shear layer. A shear layer is formed when you have two streams of different speed that begin to mix downstream of the trailing edge of the splitter plate. And they found with a sinusoidal oscillation of the vibrating ribbon, they could get enhanced growth rate of the shear layer for a while, and then there was an interval where the shear layer did not grow at all. Even though the vortices continued to rotate according to their union contract, there was no entrainment. The rental stresses vanished. The molecular mixing rate essentially vanished. And it's because the mechanism whereby the shear layer entrains is by big tons of fluid coming in. But if you manage to set up this flow, there's the separatrix here, and there is no engulfment. And so this is the flow we thought we, we were going to get, but what we ended up getting was much more um, like that. Um, this isn't a very good picture. We did a crude experiment, uh, Pratik Ranjan, who it turns out is from Bangalore and came to Seattle for a couple of summers, um, mounted uh, a wavy wall with vortex generators on an airfoil. Uh, we wanted to see if we could uh, improve the high lift characteristics. Uh, this is a plot of the drag coefficient versus angle of attack of this uh, NACA 0016 airfoil. And the, what I want to draw your attention to is uh, uh, the, the star data, where he observed a very low drag at uh, remarkably high angles of attack. Um, it turns out if you can lower the skin friction by adding these stationary vortices, that may not only lower the skin friction, but um, make the boundary layer more robust and less likely to separate and uh, help recover the energy that you invested to make the vortex in the first place. We hope to do this experiment uh, and actually measure the lift as well. The, the small tunnel didn't have the capability to measure lift to see if we can improve the L over D at, at high lift coefficient using this idea. So uh, 
the take home message I'd like you to uh, uh, have is that stationary vortices are fundamentally different from non stationary ones. Um, I tried to show both for stratified entrainment and for uh, flow near a solid surface, uh, you get completely different behavior. The fluxes are totally different. Now I'd like to shift gears and talk about accelerating vortices. We go from stationary to the other extreme. By acceleration, well, this is artist's conception of a vortex, and it has a rotation period, which in general is a function of time. For all the classical turbulent flows, oops, I didn't want to do that. For all the classical turbulent flows, this vortex rotation period increases in time. Uh, if we have a jet, uh, near the nozzle, the vortices are young and small and they're spinning very quickly. But like tenured faculty, if you get older vortices, they're much fatter and they rotate more slowly. Present company accepted, of course. And so the vortex rotation period increases in time for the turbulent flows we all know and love. Uh, here's a f famous movie in the Brown Roshko apparatus. This might have been made by Conrad, but um, we have high speed fluid there, low speed fluid there, and the shatter graph image. The splitter plate is just off the frame to the left. And uh, Many of you, of course, have seen this before. The vortices start out small, but they grow. And because this is a self-similar flow, the average width increases in proportion to the downstream station. Here's, uh, I threw this one in. Uh, Professor Narasimo was talking about uh, the mixing transition in water. Uh, this is a simultaneous side and plan view of a chemically reacting uh, shear layer, where this red stuff is produced by a fast chemical reaction. Uh, we picked red because it matched my eyes. And the splitter plate now is off to the uh, right side of the image, and the flow is from right to left. <coughs> There's an explosion in, a, in the mixing at the mixing transition. Uh, the mixing increases by orders of magnitude um, <coughs> due to the <coughs> three-dimensional instability, which produces a lot, enough surface area to digest all the fluid that gets engulfed in these big vortices. But the point, again, is that the vortices have a rotation period which is very small when they're young, and the period increases. In fact, the vortex rotation period must increase linearly in time if the flow is self-similar. And so just about every turbulent flow that's self-similar that you've seen looks like this. The shear layer, the jet wake, thermal plume, asymptotic boundary layer. But what if you force the flow? Instead of letting Mother Nature say the vortex rotation period is proportional to the age of the vortex, what if you impose a new time scale on the flow? Suppose you force exponentially, which means you have to define an e-folding time of the forcing. It's possible that Mother Nature will choose a vortex rotation period that is not the age of the vortex, but the e-folding time that you impose on it. And that turns out to be the case. <coughs> so here, it's a, again, this plot of vortex rotation period as a function of time. This is the unforced trajectory for ordinary turbulence. If you put in an exponential forcing so that there's a unique e-folding time, then the vortex rotation period latches mm -hmm. onto that e <coughs> excuse me, latches onto that e-folding time. So the vortices rotate at the same period forever. They never grow old. It's like the uh, oil of the lake cream that I use nightly. It's perpetual youth. I'll talk later about this other possibility. <coughs> Zhang and Jahari looked at the exponential jet uh, water tank where they had a jet and they could control the injection speed. The nozzle speed is a function of time could be programmed. They always started out with a non-zero initial nozzle speed. So there's nozzle speed, nozzle fluid coming out of the nozzle. 
And then at a certain instant, they start ramping up the flow rate. And I'll only address the linear profile. And notice there's a kink here where it's constant and then transitions to linear. What do you suppose happens to the entrainment when you have that kind of behavior? Here's a series of stills from a movie of theirs. <clears throat> the nozzle is uh, on the left. And they're looking at the concentration of an inert dye, and they've scaled it, uh, the gray levels of the picture, of the pixels by 1 over x. So that if the gray level is more or less constant, that corresponds to the ordinary classical steady or constant, that the speed is still increasing. But it's not increasing fast enough. What matters is how much things change during the important time scale, which is one vortex rotation period. Uh, Vortices take about one rotation to do anything. I'll demonstrate. That's the time for them to bring fluid in, entrainment, and, and mix it. We had a discussion about that uh, the other day. So, so uh, they demonstrate that uh, acceleration reduces entrainment. Uh, this ought to start looking... Uh, closely related to the famous baton uh buoyancy acceleration case, and I'll talk about that problem in a little bit. Well, that, that exponential jet is the case where the vortex rotation period was a constant, the e-folding time of uh, the acceleration. But what if instead of the e-folding time being a constant, what if we make that time itself a function of time? Now, it has to be a linear function of time to be self-similar. And so suppose it's some initial period minus alpha t, where alpha is an acceleration parameter. So that the forcing would look like this, where the e-folding time is not a constant, but changes in time. Maybe you can still control the rate at which vortices rotate, even when the e-folding time is not constant. So that corresponds to, for positive alpha, to this trajectory. Here alpha is negative, it's zero, and it's greater than zero. Um, well, in an attempt to establish a generalized theory for the effect of acceleration, um, imagine that any turbulent flow you pick has some conserved quantity. Like, for example, in the shear layer, it's delta U. In a jet, it's the thrust per unit mass. In the weight, it's the momentum thickness and so forth. That conserved quantity always has dimensions of length to some power over time to some power. And so you would force a flow um, by changing this conserved quantity in this super exponential way. Dimensionally, the, dimen the uh, dissipation rate uh, should be of this form, where Q, again, is the conserved quantity for that flow, and tau V is the vortex period. And the exponent on tau V, uh, defined to be beta, um, depends upon the flow, as you'll see in a second. It depends upon these, uh, the magnitude of the time and length dependence of the conserved quantity. This is a simple guess. This was the prettiest... Uh, relation we could think of, that the uh, fractional increase in dissipation depended on alpha and beta in this way. It is purely a guess. There may be a prettier expression out there that's correct, but uh, that's the best we've come up with so far. And according to this viewpoint, the, di the di dissipation rate then, or I should say dimensionless dissipation rate, would be an exponential function of the acceleration parameter and beta, where alpha star is the dissipation rate for the unforced flow. So this is a uh, guess, that's a model, and now let's see if it works. Uh, well, <coughs> let me first say, if you set up a table where you look at various flows, and I've only listed a few flows here, uh, Q is the conserved quantity, as I said, for the shear layer it's delta U, and for the round jet it's that, and so forth then the values for the length and time dependence are there, and in the far right column is this uh, parameter beta. Uh, 
I'll come back to this in a minute. Well, one experiment that's been done to test this is the exponential <coughs> transverse jet. Uh, in our water tunnel, we have a primary flow, and injected perpendicular to the primary flow is a secondary flow out of a very weird nozzle array, where the nozzle width increases exponentially as you go downstream, and the nozzle injection speed also increases exponentially. And it turns out the ratio of uh, the nozzle width to speed, which is the time, can be compared with how long it takes for the flow to evact a downstream distance corresponding to this e-folding length. And that ratio of quantities is this acceleration parameter. And so this is a test of if acceleration affects things. And we measured the size of the vortices. In a, in a transverse cut, you get a pair of counter-rotating vortices in this inverted mushroom. And we looked at the size of these vortices as a function, well, normalized by their separation, as a function of acceleration. So the size of the vortices normalized by their separation as a function of acceleration parameter um, drops uh, significantly. The uh, theoretical prediction is this should be an exponential decay with alpha. But why would acceleration reduce entrainment? Suppose we have uh, a jet and you have got some array of vortices. The entrainment occurs not by little nibbling vortices on the edge, but by engulfment from these big Roshko tunnels. Imagine a point one that's right in the middle of this tunnel. Now suppose we look at an accelerating jet where at later times the nozzle speed is greater than it was earlier. That means the vortex B in the accelerating case will be relatively stronger than in the non-accelerating case. Because in the accelerating case, B was generated uh, due to at a time when the nozzle speed was greater than in the non-accelerating. Well, if B is stronger, just simple induced velocity from B.O. Savar law, point one, which was in the middle of this tongue, uh, if that's strong enough, can be made right on the braid. So the tongue width has been reduced. And if that's the mechanism of entrainment, then the entrainment rate is reduced. So the cartoon is very simple. This is kindergarten. I mentioned the, the uh, landmark uh, baton Narasima experiment. Um, Imagine uh, if you have an accelerating plume, because of the acceleration, because of the additional uh, buoyancy deposited by latent heat, for example, in a cumulus cloud, there's additional baroclinic vorticity here that wouldn't be there in the non-accelerating case. Well, what would be the effect of this vorticity on the width and speed of the flow in this tunnel? Well, that vorticity is in the opposite sense from that velocity. The tongue is narrower. I think you can account for, at least qualitatively, for the reduced entrainment in just a simple cartoon. By the way, I think uh, we haven't done it. I'm not smart enough to, but I think this would be a great, a great uh, calculation, a great project for uh, an applied math student uh, to determine how the entrainment velocity uh, is a function of the strength of the added uh, circulation here. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of smart people in this room uh, who could do that. I was stimulated by uh, Krishna Murthy's uh, talk on Monday, I think it was. Um, what really puzzled me about his talk was that uh, he said that it wasn't, I, I, or I heard him, I believe he said, that it wasn't the increase in height of the flow over a mountain that determined orographic rain, but the slope. Well, 
I think you may be able to explain the dependence on slope rather than overall lift in terms of this acceleration parameter. Um, I won't get into the details, but uh, I think the acceleration parameter can be expressed in terms of uh, the wind speed, the size of the initial cloud, the initial velocity jump uh, associated with these vortices, and the uh, height that you have to raise uh, a moist parcel to change its buoyancy by a factor of E. And uh, I'd be curious to know if this ultimately ends up having any merit or not. But uh, because, uh, and this, by the way, predicts there's a critical slope at which the reduction in entrainment due to acceleration, um, and hence bringing in dry air, uh, is overwhelmed or equals the uh, additional production of uh, uh, liquid water due to the uh, condensation. And hence the cloud survives. I think uh, this acceleration parameter may also be useful in uh, quantifying how, I think you call it preconditioning or prehumidifying associated with uh, the early phases of cumulus uh, development where they deposit uh, water vapor early. My geology uh, colleague George Brigance told me that there's a um, very strange observation uh, at a volcano. Apparently they can, I'm not a geologist, but he tells me that they can identify by the con chemical constituents. I suppose your wife would know this. Um, there's evidence that there was a volcano that had a magma chamber initially full of magma A. Then a, a chemically distinct magma B was injected into this chamber. And magma B had a lot more water in solution. And as it rose, some of that water came out as water vapor. The circulation phase changed, just like latent heat. Big buoyancy change, because water vapor is a lot lighter than molten rock. And what's observed as the geologists crawl around on the surface of the volcano is that even though Magma A was the first magma in the chamber. It's deposited on top of magma B. Magma B somehow was able to make it all the way across this magma chamber with very little entrainment of A diluting into it. In a batten Arisima kind of flow, we speculate, where there's a lot of buoyancy addition. If there's sufficiently violent buoyancy addition, as they've shown, uh, the spreading angle of a buoyant flow can be reduced. Well, I mentioned earlier that this uh, theory is too fancy a word, this speculation that the dissipation rate depends exponentially on the acceleration. Um, and it depends upon the sign of beta. Well, it turns out every canonical laboratory flow the shear layer, jet weight, thermal plume, et cetera, et cetera, has a negative value of beta. I've only shown three different flows here uh, when that's the case, but you can check any of the canonical laboratory flows. Beta is always negative, except for two, pro two cases. Rayleigh-Taylor, I should say Rayleigh-Taylor is where you have heavy fluid on top of light fluid, or Light fluid being accelerated into heavy fluid. Gravity and acceleration are very distinguishable. For Rayleigh-Taylor, beta is plus one. And so instead of dissipation rate um, decreasing with alpha, the dissipation rate is predicted to increase with acceleration. And there's uh, numerical uh, DNS uh, simulations by uh, Cook at uh, Lawrence Livermore that, that show that that's the case. We're still working on getting more of those. Oops. The other flow for which beta is uh, non-negative is the inertial cascade. If you follow in a Lagrangian sense, maybe that's not the right term, but follow the energy, 
in an inertial cascade from the biggest eddy all the way down in the classical Kamogorov cascade to the smallest eddies. The conserved quantity is uh, uh, V sub lambda cubed over lambda, where lambda is the eddy size. And when you work this out, beta is zero. And it turns out if you ask what the dissipation rate is for this degenerate case, the dissipation rate is zero, according to this model. And of course, that's the consistent with the intrinsic assumption that the inertial cascade is inertial. Yeah, thank you. You're way ahead of me. Um, so why would Rayleigh-Taylor flow be different? What's, what's intrinsically different about that? Well, remember I showed earlier the uh, crude cartoon of the accelerating plume, the baton Arasima flow. The baroclinic torques associated with the acceleration oppose Roshko's tongue. But the cartoon for Rayleigh-Taylor is exactly the opposite. The additional baroclinic vorticity associated with acceleration in Rayleigh-Taylor supports the tongue, enhances it. We believe that Rayleigh-Taylor is unique. It's the only one for which this is the case. I think I, well, I'll, I'll just briefly mention, uh, this is really an aside. Um, the first part of this talk was about stationary vortices, and the second half was about violently accelerating vortices. Seemingly two very different things, opposite ends of the spectrum. But if you have a really high acceleration rate, if alpha is very high, it turns out these vortices, which we've seen are very small, it also is true that they don't get very far from the nozzle. They're sort of stationary there. And it may be that really violent acceleration in a weird kind of way is almost like stationary flow. In both cases, uh, entrainment rates are vastly different from the ordinary unforced flows. So conclusion part two, I hope I've persuaded you that acceleration in general inhibits entrainment. That shouldn't be too hard if you uh, are aware of the baton Narasima work. But we think this is true in general, and it depends exponentially on acceleration, with two sole exceptions, Rayleigh-Taylor and, of course, the inertial cascade. Based on these arguments, do you think it would be possible to find a relation for the entrainment coefficient which uh, replaces the Morton Taylor Turner or, uh, or uh, improves it? Or You're talking about the dimensionless coefficient in front? Yes, I'm talking about the dimensionless coefficient in front. Um, I'm not smart enough to do it, but um, uh, it may be possible if you drink the Kool-Aid on this simple kind of cartoon, if you, if you embrace Roshko's tongue as this yeah. is the only pipeline coming into the flow, yeah. then um, it may be possible to say something about not just if there was the correct exponential dependence according to the model, unincreased vorticity here, but maybe even something about the coefficient in front. I, I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. It's above my pay grade. I would be quite happy if I could talk somebody into just doing the exponential test. Second of all, your initial question about the tilting, the depth is in depth and precessing. You determine the precessing we didn't, uh, yeah, we, we picked one. Uh, we did not uh, do a systematic study. Uh, let me just. 
we picked this angle. 15 degrees is roughly the half angle. So there's some rationality there. We picked the precession speed uh, slow enough so that, um, uh, or I should say fast enough, so that we thought we wouldn't get stationary behavior. That turns out to have been um, uh, uh, misguided in that um, I forgot, I didn't mention it. The, the X's are the data for the precessing case. The pluses are the data, if you don't precess it, you just leave it at 15 degrees. And you get more or less the same slope, even without any motion. I forgot to mention uh, <coughs> this minus 3 halves law is what's observed if the turbulence is an oscillating grid rather than an impinging jet. <coughs> and it was also uh, shown by Linden that if you have a vortex ring impinging on the interface, if the physics are kind of interesting. When a vortex ring, a non-steady vortex ring, impinges on the interface, this, it, it's like a spring. It, it raises a dome, and then there's a rebound. There's no entrainment or mixing during the initial part, and it's the rebound that produces a vortex that goes down, which is a completely different vortex from the stationary lateral vortices in the uh, vertical case. There, and you can make an argument <laughs> that, that accounts or that uh, attempts to justify the minus one half and minus three halves behavior. Uh, but we think that it's the rebound that's associated with this behavior. And apparently, you don't even need much of a rebound. Just 15 degrees of tilt <coughs> apparently <coughs> destroys uh, enough stationarity, if stationarity really is the explanation, to uh, give you this rather than that. Stratification is. Stratification is very uh, significant for Yeah. So I, I was thinking of those experiments that Bill Reynolds did. With blooming oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which also pisses us around. Yeah. But that's figured by what he does at the source of the jet. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, there is pisses us around. So there is that thing which uh, turns it around near the orifice, near the source. Yeah. Blooms out, and in a sense, you must be doing that too, right? I mean, normally you determine exactly the angle at which it does that. Yeah. He doesn't determine the angle, but he processes it, and the angle blooms out. If I were guessing, I would say that <coughs> our precession rate was sufficiently <coughs> slow that, that this was uh, not dynamically affected much. Uh, so you just want the individual jet which is going on. Right. It was a nozzle block with a tilted nozzle. We rotated the whole block relatively slowly. I, I don't remember the numbers. But uh, I don't think it affected the dynamics of the vortices here much, I'm guessing. Uh, but it had a, a stunning effect on what's happening at the interface. I mean, two orders of magnitude, and, and I think it could be much more than that. Uh, I, there are experts here in geophysics, <coughs> geophysical flows, there may be geophysical applications of this. Maybe uh, topography constrained flows like stratified flow around a hill where the topography constrains vortices to be stationary. Uh, we have, of course, we're so close to the problem, we may not be objective, but uh, we think the evidence is sufficiently compelling that the physics changes that uh, if there was a geophysical application, for example, what happens when flows impinge on the uh, tropopause? these big towering things. Uh, is that persistent or non-persistent? Um, I, I might say one other thing. Uh, I was very depressed when uh, a reviewer pointed out that our theory couldn't possibly be right because it's known, according to somebody's experiment, <coughs> that an impinging plume gives the minus three halves regime, whereas our impinging jet clearly showed minus one half. Well, if a vertical plume behaved differently in the vertical jet and the plume and jet look sort of the same, we maybe had to go back to the drawing board. Maybe our theory was totally wrong. Of course, that could still be the case. But when I looked at the literature on a plume, it turns out the plume fluctuates much more. The uh, probability density function for ambient fluid making it all the way to the center line is much higher for the plume than for the jet. So I'm hoping, for the sake of this theory, 
that that might account for the dramatically different behavior between the plume and the jet. It, it evidently doesn't take much change in the impinging flow to completely change the answer by orders of magnitude. So there's something very sensitive here. And I would think if there, if there is some geophysical situation where you can get the stationary versus the non-stationary, there ought to be a spectacular effect there. But I, I don't have enough experience in geophysical flows to identify that. But maybe someone here. <laughs>